In the spring of 1978, Afghanistan was already not a peaceful area. The Afghan president, Mohammad Daoud Khan, took power in 1973 after overthrowing his cousin, King Zahir Shah, and establishing the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan with the National Revolutionary Party of Afghanistan as the only legal political party. The regime looked even more repressive than it was under the monarchy. Daoud's government faced social unrest and disorder in the very first months of its foundation. The opposition primarily united groups who followed traditional Islamic values and hated the secular regime with questionable legitimacy. Very soon, this same opposition would become known as the Mujahideen in the Soviet-Afghan War. But the collapse of Daoud's regime was caused by an unexpected power. On the morning of April 27, 1978, President Daoud was with his family at Ark Palace in Kabul. After the family breakfast, the ministers arrived to the palace for a routine meeting with the president. At noon, Daoud was informed by his guards that one tank had arrived and was at the palace gates. The president immediately commanded an investigation to figure out what was going on and to send the tank back to its base. Major Zaya, the head of the guards, was authorized to talk to the tank commander. Senior Captain Umar, who commanded the tank, said that he arrived with several other tanks to strengthen security at the palace. Zaya was confused, since he had heard nothing of the strengthening. Finally, he commanded Umar to drive back to the base. The motors of the tank turned on, the tank drove away from the gates, but then turned onto another lane and stopped there, although now invisible to the guards. Umar was waiting till the other machines of the 4th Tank Brigade joined him. Then they opened fire at the palace, while another group of tanks attacked the Ministry of Defense and destroyed the phone connection with the palace. The Air Force supported the attack. Ark Palace was bombed several times by planes. The Assault lasted the rest of the day and the entire night. Most of the people inside were killed, including Daoud, his family members, and his ministers. The state was now headless, and the only task for the winners was to fill the vacuum of power. The attackers lost just a few people, and only when the entire tank crew died when their tank fell from a bridge into the Kabul River. Nur Muhammad Taraki, the leader of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, was declared the new president. Many of the military who took part in the assault now occupied positions in the government. Mohammad Vantajar, a tank commander, became the interior minister, and Saeed Mohammad Gulabzoi, the pilot who bombed Ark Palace, was appointed as the Minister of Communications. The new authorities broadcast an appeal and declared that the event was not actually a coup, but the revolution supported nationally. The People's Democratic Party rose to the power, but could not solve its internal problems. Being established in 1965, the party soon divided into two factions. The factions fell into tough competition, and their members occasionally killed each other in the best of medieval traditions. Nur Mohammad Taraki became the leader of the more radical faction called Khalq, which meant the nation. He offered to form Afghan society according to the principles of the Soviet society. So to do this, Afghanistan had to be purged of any form of religion and private property. Taraki was so inspired by the bloodless revolution that he promised to make the entire country atheistic within five years. The land was nationalized. 
Taraki said that all the peasants could take their part of arable land, free, without cost. But his populism was met with little enthusiasm. The general population stayed Muslim. The rebellious groups who fought against Daoud before that now turned out to be a much more hateful enemy. Afghan provinces began spiraling out of control. Previously, the Islamic opposition had moved to Pakistan to escape repressions by Daoud. For several years, it provided guerrilla actions against Daoud's regime, and it now declared the Holy War, or Jihad, on the new atheistic communist government. The opposition found more and more support among the rural Afghan population who were disturbed by the official campaign against Islamic traditions. The USSR sent its military advisors and weapons to its ally, but first stayed away from the internal Afghan conflict. The problem was that Taraki stood for quick, radical, intransient reforms, and his Soviet advisors were unable to evaluate the actual power of tradition in Afghanistan. In Moscow, the high-ranking Soviet statesman, Mikhail Suslov, said that Afghanistan was going to follow the Mongolian experience of the early 1920s. Then, the communists took power in poor agricultural Mongolia and made it the true ally of the USSR. But the time and cultural differences between Mongolia and Afghanistan, while obvious to an historian, were not obvious to the politicians who thought in accordance with the postulates of Marxist theory. For them, Afghanistan in 1978 and Mongolia in 1921 were feudal countries, first of all. They were placed at the same stage of the social evolution. Then the principles of their functioning and changes looked similar to such people as Suslov. They were really happy to see the communist revolution in Afghanistan, especially at the time when neighboring Iran initiated its Islamic revolution and worried the USSR about the situation at its own southern border. This concern grew stronger when the new Afghan government faced both the national Islamic opposition and massive desertion in the army. It actually was much of Taraki's fault. In the situation when the civil war began and he needed the support, Taraki continued purging his own party and the army. He was more afraid of being replaced than of his failing civil war. Anyone who dared to criticize his radical policy towards religion and landlords was perceived by Taraki as an enemy. On March 15, 1979, the 17th Division of the Afghan Army rebelled in the city of Herat in the northwest part of Afghanistan. This time it was suppressed by the loyal regiments, but Taraki was not able to trust his army anymore. Three days after the Herat incident, he contacted the Soviet Prime Minister, Alexei Kusigin, and asked for Soviet troops to support his regime. On March 20th, 1979, Taraki came to Moscow, but Kosygin informed him that, quote, we discussed the possibility in different ways, but came to the conclusion that the action of this type would not improve the situation in your country, but make it even worse, end quote. The same day, Taraki met with General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev, who told him, quote, the problem was thoroughly analyzed, and I think we should not do that. Your and our enemies could turn the action in their favor. I hope you will accept these as our wishes." End quote. To make Taraki feel better, however, Brezhnev promised to supply more weapons, vehicles, and equipment without charge to Afghanistan. Taraki did accept the suggestion of stopping the purges in his party. The Soviet politicians also suggested offering some positions in the government to the moderate faction members and the people who served under Zaire Shah and Daoud. 
the Kremlin felt that this action could provide more support to the regime. In August 1979, the Special Soviet representative, Ponomaryov, arrived in Kabul to discuss the project with Turaki. But the Afghan leader did not accept it. One month later, Turaki was arrested by his former protege, Havazullah Amin, in a coup. The new leader declared he was still the ally of the USSR, but in fact aspired to be independent in his decisions. He refused to release Taraki and said that the overthrown leader would be judged in Kabul. The only information of the trial was the decree issued by the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. In that decree, Taraki was accused of an assassination attempt on Hafizullah Amin. On October 9, 1979, Turaki was smothered with a pillow by Amin's people. The radio and TV in Kabul broadcast the breaking news. They informed the nation that Turaki had died as the result of a long-term illness. Turaki's wife and 27 other family members ended up at Pulicharki Prison, which is still in service as the largest prison in Afghanistan. The party was purged again, this time by Amin. Three high-ranking members of Turaki's regime, Gulabzoy, Bentajar, and Sawari, escaped to the Soviet embassy and then were secretly transported to the Bagram Air Base and left for Moscow. They would come back in December of 1979, this time accompanied by the Soviet troops. And that will be a different story. We're glad you could join us for this episode in Deviant History. Please like us, and we'll see you again next week.